first rule of warfare is never underestimate your opponent. Unfortunately, when it comes to the war against climate change, we do this often. My name is Sujana Gomez. I'm a master's candidate at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada. And my research focuses on understanding the inner workings of an underestimated and overlooked enemy in the war against climate change. And this is bacteria that produce greenhouse gas. When we think of greenhouse gases, we hear a lot about reducing our carbon footprint, decreasing our carbon dioxide and methane emissions, but there is another greenhouse gas that is just as concerned, and that is nitrous oxide. Yes, you might know of nitrous oxide as laughing gas, the same thing that you get before a surgery that makes you a little loopy is also a very potent greenhouse gas. In fact, it has nearly 300 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide, and it's the third most abundant greenhouse gas in our atmosphere. According to the US Environmental Protection Agency, they identified that 7% of all greenhouse gas emissions in 2019 in the US was nitrous oxide. This comprehensive study by Tim et al, published in Nature in 2020, studied the sources and sinks of nitrous oxide over several decades. And they found that agriculture, natural soils, and oceans are the three biggest sources of nitrous oxide. And out of these, out of the, all the anthropogenic sources, agriculture accounted for more than half the amount. One of the reasons that these environments are the biggest sources for nitrous oxide is that all of them host a lot of microbes. And some of these microbes are responsible for producing nitrous oxide. In my research, I study one specific group of these microbes known as ammonia oxidizing bacteria, or AOB. These are a group of bacteria whose primary energy deriving mechanism is the oxidation of ammonia to nitrite. And these bacteria are particularly relevant for the loss or removal of ammonia and urea from agricultural soils and also from wastewater treatment plants. It will be also part of the global nitrogen cycle. The global nitrogen cycle describes how nitrogenous compounds cycle through our environment and also through organisms and the major processes that are involved in that. This includes the process of nitrification, denitrification, nitrogen fixation, among many others. And ammonia oxidizing bacteria carry out one step of this global nitrogen cycle. And even though this might seem a little trivial, their activity actually has a large impact on all of the rest of the compounds and the balance of all of these nitrogenous compounds in the global nitrogen cycle. The oxidation of ammonia to nitrate is the first step of the process of nitrification. And this is the step carried out by ammonia oxidizing bacteria. The second step is nitrite oxidation and is carried out by nitrite oxidizing bacteria. I've also included here the major enzymes that are essential for these two processes, AMO for ammonia monoxygenase, HAO for hydroxylamine oxidoreductase, and NXR for nitrite oxidoreductase. Ammonia oxidizing bacteria oxidize ammonia to hydroxylamine, and then to nitric oxide, and then to nitrite in ammonia oxidation using oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor. And they produce nitrous oxide in two ways. Firstly, during ammonia oxidation, they produce these intermediates hydroxylamine and nitric oxide that can interact chemically and produce nitrous oxide. These interactions can also be facilitated by bacteriocytochromes. And overall, this produces very small amounts of nitrous oxide that is not typically measurable by the instruments we use. The second way, however, produces far more significant amounts of nitrous oxide by comparison. And this process is called nitrifier denitrification. Now that's a bit of an oxymoron, but I can explain. As I mentioned, AOB are part of the process of nitrification, and so they are nitrifying bacteria and they oxidize ammonia to nitrite using oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor. 
but in hypoxic environments where oxygen availability is low, they can switch to an alternate mechanism to keep those electrons flowing so that they can keep generating energy. And this is when they start reducing nitrite back to nitric oxide and to nitrous oxide. And this process of reducing nitrite to nitrous oxide is a denitrification reaction. And that's why this process is called nitrifier denitrification. It's denitrification by nitrifying bacteria. Because of this process, there is a lot of interest in developing nitrification inhibitors to stop the production of nitrous oxide through this nitrifier denitrification process. However, looking at my slide, I'm sure you can tell what the problem is. These question marks indicate that we are yet to identify what bacterial enzyme or enzymes are responsible for oxidizing nitric oxide to nitrite and also for reducing nitrite back to nitric oxide. So the problem here is that we cannot develop effective solutions and effective nitrification inhibitors based on this incomplete or inaccurate information. One reason for this incomplete knowledge is that most of what we know about AOB are based on the model organ synthesis group, which is Nitrosomonas europea. And while this strain has given us a wealth of information about the physiology and the enzymatic processes of AOB, it's not the best representative of all of the diversity of AOB that exists in the world. Nitrosomonas europea is a eutrophic strain that can be easily cultured in the lab. However, there are many different strains of AOB that are adapted to different environments, different levels of nutrients, and different communities. And so we cannot generalize all of the processes that go on in AOB based on Nitrosomonas europea alone. So it's important that we study other strains of AOB to widen our understanding. The previous model of uh, nitrifier denitrification based on Nitrosomonas europea implicated this near K enzyme, which is the copper containing nitrite reductase that is also found in denitrifying bacteria, as the primary nitrite reductase essential for nitrifier denitrification. It also identified MOB, nitric oxide reductase, as essential for this process as well. However, more recent studies indicate that this might not be totally accurate. A study by Koslowski et al. in 2014 studied NIRK and NORB deficient strains of Nitrosomonas europea, and they found that strains that lacked NIRK enzyme were still able to produce nitrous oxide, while the strains that lacked NORB were not. And then it concluded that while NORB is essential for nitrified denitrification, NIRK is not, which means we still don't know which nitrite reductase is essential for nitrified denitrification. This was corroborated by another study by the same group in 2016, which examined the nitrous oxide producing capabilities of many different strains of, uh, of ammonia oxidizing bacteria in microrespiratory experiments, where they found some intriguing results on another strain called Nitrosomonas communis. This strain was able to produce nitric oxide and nitrous oxide in these microrespiratory experiments. And its genome has some inventory for nitrified nitrification, specifically it has more B. But it does not have any known nitrite reductases in its genome. It is naturally deficient for the NERK enzyme. And therefore, this strain is a good candidate for studying this pathway and identifying other nitrite reductases. And this brings me to my research, where the aim of my work is to resolve this nitrifier denitrification pathway in nitrosomonas communities. I'm working under the hypothesis that there are unidentified enzymes responsible for nitrite reduction and, or nitric oxide oxidation in nitrosomonas communities and that these enzymes are potentially also relevant to other strains of ammonia oxidizing bacteria. In resolving this pathway, the goal is to have an updated and more accurate model for nitrified denitrification, which can then be used to develop effective methods of nitrous oxide mitigation. The approach for my project is 
consists of two major uh, areas. First is the physiological studies to confirm that nitrosamine as communist can indeed enzymatically produce nitrous oxide. Second is a comparative proteomics approach to identify potential enzymes that uh, might be essential to producing nitrous oxide. In terms of the physiology, nitrosomonas communis has not been extensively studied before. So uh, I have some experiments about their growth with oxygen limitation to examine their ability to produce nitrous oxide. I also have some resting cell assays to confirm their ability to reduce nitrite enzymatically. And these physiological studies are done in comparison with nitrosomonas europea uh, as a control group since we know what is expected from that strain, and it also serves as a comparison point to existing literature. So first I have some growth experiments, and for these, culture in B is pretty different from culture in many other types of uh, bacteria. Since their growth substrate is ammonium, they are cultured in media that is buffered with TBs and uh, contains mineral salt as well as ammonium salts. They are cultured in batches in wheaten bottles with gas tight into rubber caps, which allows us to contain and measure the amounts of gas that are produced or cons consumed during growth. They're slow growing bacteria. They take three to seven days to reach stationary phase based on the conditions that they're growing in. They also grow to very low turbidity. So instead of using op optical density as a proxy for growth, I actually use the acidic grease assay, which is a colorimetric assay that measures the concentration of nitrite. And to measure the production of oxygen and the consumption of nitrous, sorry, the consumption of oxygen and the production of nitrous oxide, I use a thermal conductivity gas chromatograph. So my first graph here is showing nitrite concentration on the biaxid in millimolar amounts as um, function of time in hours. So the three lines here, the controls, the cell three controls are shown in gray, nitrosomonas communis shown in orange, and nitrosomonas europea shown in blue. <clears throat> and these cultures were sampled at 12 hour time points, and the amount of nitrite was measured using the acidic grease assay. And as you can see, the nitrite concentration mimics a typical uh, bacterial growth curve with a lag phase, an exponential growth phase, and a stationary phase. The second graph I have here shows the consumption of oxygen with this uh, left axis in millimoles and time in 12-hour time points again. So these cultures were sampled at 12-hour time points and measured and uh, analyzed through gas chromatography. And the dotted lines here show the consumption of oxygen the colors are consistent. The solid lines show the production of nitrous oxide with this right axis in micromole amounts. And as you can see, at <clears throat> towards the end of the lab phase, they start producing nitrous oxide. And at end point, nitrosomonas communis was able to produce about a third of the amount of nitrous oxide that was produced by nitrosomonas europea. So these results, confirm that nitrosomonas communis is able to produce nitrous oxide in oxygen-limited growth at the onset of hypoxia. To confirm that the observed nitrous oxide is due to nitrifier denitrification and not a result of the interactions between intermediates produced during ammonia oxidation, I have the resting cell assay experiments. In these assays, Cells were grown to stationary phase and they were removed from their growth medium and concentrated down to a 10 to the 10 cell count. And these cells were resuspended in ammonia free heat phase buffer and put into these glass vials that were sealed. And the cells were provided with nitrite as a substrate and an external reductant. Then the vials were charged with nitrogen to anoxia. And the vials were incubated and then sampled at different time points and analyzed through gas chromatography. We have two types of external reductants here. So first is benzene methosulfate with ascorbic acid, which is an artificial electron donor and shuttle. 
So it facilitates the reduction of nitrate without interfering with the physiological process of um, nitrate reduction with, by the bacteria. The other is hydrazine. Hydrazine is a co-substrate for the hydroxylamine oxidoreductase, which is part of the ammonia oxidation pathway. However, it does not allow the cells to produce nitrite. So while facilitating nitrite reduction by serving as a reductant, it does not allow the AAB to produce nitrite. We also have the controls of killed cells with all of the relevant substrate, um, but also live cells with only nitride or with only reductant to make sure that what we are observing is to enzymatic reduction of nitride to nitrous oxide. So in these two graphs, I have micromole amounts of nitrous oxide that were measured for 10 to the 10 amounts of cells. And with the PMS and ascorbic acid conditions, I have a time point of 72 hours since this reductant uh, operates a little bit more slowly. And with the hydrazine, I have many time points and hours going from one hour, two hours, all the way up to 72 hours. As seen by the orange bars here, this does confirm that nitrosomonas communis is able to produce nitrous oxide by the reduction of nitrite. This means that nitrified denitrification is active in nitrous monas communis. However, as you can see, the amounts of nitrous oxide produced by the two strains are quite different. And this reinforces the idea that there is a clear enzymatic difference between the two strains and that we cannot base all of our conclusions on this model organism and Europea alone. And it's essential that we study individual strains to widen our understanding. The next step in my project that I'm currently working on is the comparative proteomics approach. The goal here is to identify potential enzymes with possible nitrite reductase activity based on the differences observed in the proteome at different stages of growth. So here I have a graph, again, showing the nitrous oxide production by nitrosomonas communis under oxygen limited growth. It's very similar to the graph I'd shown before, except it's only showing nitrous oxide this time. And I have indicated the sampling points for the mid log phase and the stationary phase. So cells are grown up until 48 hours and then harvested, and then we will examine the proteome at that point. And then cells that are grown in the same condition for up to 84 hours or 96 hours will then be sampled and their proteome will be examined as well. These proteomes will be examined using liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry. And we are expecting to see a big difference in the relative abundances of some proteins between these two stages that will allow us to identify some potential enzymes that are essential for nitrified denitrification. So the 48 hours is just before the strain starts uh, producing observable amounts of nitrous oxide, and at 84 hours, nitrous oxide production is very high. So our approach is that the uh, enzyme and protein con content will reflect that some proteins are more abundant at the stationary phase when nitrous oxide production is high. The ultimate goal of this work, of course, is to resolve this nitrified denitrification pathway. And so in order to confirm that, any candidate enzymes I will identify in my work will need to be tested for nitrite reductase activity, either through, the, um, through studying them as purified proteins or with a genetic engineering approach with the corresponding genes. As I keep mentioning, it's also important to compare these results to other strains and see if these enzymes would be relevant to other strains of ammonia oxidizing bacteria. In terms of real world application, this work is most important for the development of effective nitrification inhibitors. This will give us an updated and uh, possibly more accurate model of nitrified denitrification in ammonia oxidizing bacteria. So basic research like this where we study one small pathway in tiny bacteria can feel very trivial and disconnected from the real world applications that have meaningful change. However, in order for these real world applications to be effective, they need to be based on the best information we can get. 
basing our solutions on incorrect assumptions and incomplete models is the same thing as charging into battle with an unloaded gun. And this is why research like mine matters, because these enzymes and these bacteria in this pathway contributes to the global increase of greenhouse gas. And understanding how greenhouse gases work at the microscopic scale is like honing another essential weapon in the arsenal against the war and climate change. And with that, I'd like to extend my gratitude to my uh, supervisor, Dr. Lisa Stein, Dr. Van Urich, who is assisting us with the podium work, my lab mates and friends who have contributed to my work in many ways. I'd also like to acknowledge my funding sources, the University of Alberta, and also the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. And thank you very much for listening to my talk.